In Britain's cities and across its countryside, people are secretly preparing. I'm preparing for civil unrest, the fall of the economy and natural disasters. I'm preparing for economical collapse, a, a nuclear biological chemical attack. I'm preparing for the breakdown of law and order and a complete loss of services. From shop workers to schoolboys, these ordinary people have extraordinary secret lives. They call themselves preppers because they're preparing for the end of the world as we know it. I'd be fairly guaranteed that I could provide food for my family. I look at this as more reliable than my best friend. These are the stories of 10 British preppers. They've spent their lives and their cash getting ready for disaster. Rule of law can and will break down. People will kill you for a day's worth of food. Are they paranoid, delusional, or should the rest of us be joining them? News in the 21st century often tells a catastrophic story. From nuclear disaster, to rogue governments, continuing financial crisis, and bloody revolutions. The civil war increasingly hallmarked by the massacres of civilians. Britain has had its own problems. For most, life goes on as normal, but a secretive community of Brits is convinced their country could be the home of the next disaster. Just because it hasn't happened, doesn't say it won't. We think we're above nature and we control it. But in actual fact, we control nothing. If you end up waiting for a disaster to happen, it's already too late. You need to have yourself sorted out to begin with. Scott is a 41-year-old supermarket worker from Somerset. He's also a prepper. Prepping to me is just a way of guaranteeing that your way of life will carry on when everybody else's has gone down the path. Disasters happen. One day, something may go wrong. Scott is preparing for all sorts of disasters, but there's one thing that tops his list. What's the worst thing that I really, really hope never happens? Government takeover. There are a number of totalitarian regimes in the world. Britain isn't one of them, but Scott is still concerned. I've noticed over the last few years there's been a certain amount of liberties have been taken from the general population. Hitler said, if you want to conquer a nation, you disarm them. At the moment in England, it's very, very uh, difficult to own firearms and blades, and there's nothing that anybody can do about it. Knives are a key component of every prepper's kit. Scott makes his own, and in the garage next to his house, this prepper is getting tooled up. What I'm making here are bushcraft knives and choppers, basically. It, it's a a bushcraft meets an Armageddon style blade. In terms of prepping, in terms of virtually every outdoor task, the knife will give you just about everything. You can use a knife to make a shelter, you can use a knife to create a fire, and I look at this as more reliable than my best friend. People will let me down, generally speaking, this won't. Scott's made nearly a hundred blades from scratch from tiny knives to this one metre long sword. To make a knife out of steel, you've got to give steel the heat treat it needs. You can put the constituents into a cake until you bake it right, you haven't got something that's edible. There's my paper templates. As well as making knives, Scott likes to share his knowledge with other preppers over the internet. So in three sections, it's got three different widths of blade of saw cut. One saw blade, two saw blade, three. He also likes to share his fears for the future. The way things, the world's going, 
just things are changing all the time, and they all seem to be changing. Not necessary for the bear. If things do change for the worse, Scott's ready. He's got his knives, and he's also got a plan to escape. If you're going to make the move and you're going to decide on leaving, you've got to leave now. Because as more and more people decide they want to leave the situation, the more and more chance the roads are going to be gridlocked. So if you make the decision you've got to go, you've got to go quick. Preppers call it bugging out, and today Scott is doing a dry run. If we've got federal law suddenly come down and the army are now evacuating us to camp somewhere, well, the option of bugging out is taking what you can and leaving and going somewhere where you think you'll have a chance. 30 minutes into the bug out drill and Scott reaches his safe hideaway, the local woods. One of the many things about prepping and bugging out is I haven't got just one bug out zone or one personal space. So when I came to this zone, I've already made my markers using two rocks. When you all start getting stressed out, you don't want to make a mistake and miss that lovely little sweet spot that you found a few weeks ago. In today's scenario, Scott is simulating arriving at camp, having already been injured. You're allowed your weak arm and only one tool, build a shelter. That's the challenge. So that goes there. Basically, all the stages involved in this shelter I've achieved with one arm. I built a rake with my one tool to get the leaves on. And the purpose of this is to get a small cocoon so you can shelter and the rain won't land on you. With his shelter rainproofed, all Scott needs now is fire, and he has a novel technique for making it. There's many ways of lighting a fire. What I'm using is a household metal cleaner. First thing you do is you put that away. Average brand baby oil. Once it's lit, that's all it needs to get going. There's cheating and there's prepping. If someone can appreciate the fact that I've got a lot of ideas that may not be completely in line with yours and they can accept it, that's great. But when people think, why do you want to do that? I, I do find it a little bit upsetting, but if you looked in their car and they've got a crate and it's got half a tank of oil in it and it's got a spare can of petrol in it and it's got a warning triangle and a reflective vest, sorry mate, you're still prepping. You're just the same as I am. If it started to die, as long as I got a flame, it's not the end of the world. Hit the turbo button. Not all preppers are lone survivalists. In Northern Ireland, a group of born-again Christians believes in strength in numbers. We don't know what's around the corner. Only God knows that. For me, if you need to have this sort of group of people that you can bet your life on. And if, they, if you shout, they'll come running. The group is led by 31-year-old IT engineer, Tom. My role, I do a lot of hunting. Clinton is uh, basically the bushcraft guru. Wayne is uh, so the engineer. Uh, Craig is our first aid uh, responder. People have referred to us as the A-team. Yeah. You're Hannibal, you make the plan come yeah. together. <laughs> he makes the plan, he's the facilitator. We're pack animals. We look out for each other, you know? if. If, someone, if someone's down, someone's hurt, you know? There's someone there to back that person up. Yeah, I'll take a swig of this, I'll give you a hand. The Friends Support Network isn't just physical, it's also spiritual. I am a sledgehammer in God's toolbox. The thing that sums it up is the sacrifice. That's the bottom line. 
through his pain you gain an eternal life. Our faith is everything to us. Central is Jesus Christ in our lives. Most important part of our EDC, yeah. our everyday carry, is the Bible. It's something I have mine on a, an app on my, yeah. on my iPhone. There's a verse from the Bible I'd like to share. This is a promise from God to his people. I will make with them a covenant, a promise, so that they may dwell securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Yeah. Scripture prepares me for whatever in life. And I know that a lot of preppers prep out of fear, fear of the unknown. They're, they're trying to um, develop a coping mechanism for what may happen, okay? I don't know the future, but I do know who holds my future. And that faith gives me reassurance. Since the 1960s, terrorism and unrest have been a constant source of danger and uncertainty for Northern Ireland, with violence on both sides, from Republicans demanding a united Ireland and Loyalists wanting to keep Northern Ireland as part of the UK. Growing up in Northern Ireland, there wasn't really a day gone by that there wasn't something on the news. It sort of makes you aware that bad things can happen. My dad always taught me, if you're caught up on a bomb scare and you think you've gone far enough away, just keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going. Tom, Wayne, Clinton and Craig regularly practice bugging out of the town. And while the others set up camp, it's Tom and Wayne's job to hunt. If we came to a scenario where, where the shops weren't open, um, where there was nothing on, nothing to eat, um, I'd be fairly guaranteed that I could provide food for my family. My father told me stories of, of him growing up with a single barrel shotgun and three cartridges and going out and having to get a rabbit for their dinner. And if you didn't bring one back, you didn't eat. I usually go out with a shotgun. Wayne is better skilled with a rifle. So we're backed up, myself with a shotgun. Wayne can take something that's uh, further distance away. Uh, that's a ground animal. I feel with this partnership that it's, um, it's a good combo. Tom's ideas are influenced by his own life experiences. When I was um, 19, I was coming back from, from a job at a school and there was a, a vehicle collision with a, a fire engine. Ran over to the car. There's two men just behind the car saying that that wee girl, that wee child's dead, that wee child's dead. And uh, I got up, just stepped back and there was an 18 month old baby that was killed. Obviously, I couldn't have done anything for her, but it felt so helpless. There was other people in the car that I couldn't help. And that's when I decided I didn't want to be a victim. Next time, I'm doing something and I'm going to be prepared to help somebody else. I need meat! Back at the camp, it's dinner time. Get a, get a fire going shortly. Do you want some chocolate? Clinton used to work in an abattoir, so if disaster strikes, the job of team butcher falls to him. What I'm simply going to do here is prepare this by hand. So I'm going to take the head off, take the wings off, strip back flesh and peel the two breasts off. That's the theory. <laughs> we'll see what happens in practice. <laughs> so you get your thumbs down in there and just push. Yeah. You're, see, sa I... you're saving your blade, you're not having to use your knife. And, and all we're going to do now is we're not going to take these parts, we're just going to eat the breast, so yeah. in behind the breastbone, yeah. and then pull forward. Oh, cool. And that's it, full that's it. Happy days. Dinner is served. 
And with their combined skills, the four friends feel they're prepared for anything the world may bring. Seriously, this is mental. Right. Whoa, oh, we got got <laughs> Except maybe an exploding camp kettle. Dude. This is what happens when you raise the Northern Ireland during the Troubles. <laughs> How to cook? Use explosives! Preppers are getting ready for all kinds of catastrophes. In a pandemic, you've got a situation where lots and lots of people will die far too quickly for, say, the National Health Service to cope with. From 1918 to 1920, with many countries still reeling from the First World War, so-called Spanish flu killed around 50 million people worldwide. In the UK alone, 250,000 people died, and one British prepper is worried another killer virus may be just around the corner. People would die like flies, so your basic threat is being cheap by jowl with a lot of other people, and then you're secondary threat is having to go into towns and cities to get stuff. Zach is 42. Three years ago, he left his terraced house in densely populated Leeds. He preps by living off the grid and has come up with a unique way to escape the crowded city. Well, this is my teepee where I've been living for the last few years. First and foremost is the stove, and that's, that's kind of your, your, like, your absolute lifeline. It will do everything. I've baked bread on it. You can cook your food on it, dry your clothes, get warm. Um, got my bed, which is just made of a couple of futon mattresses on top of a couple of pallets. You could kind of say that I have bugged out already. Zach hasn't just bugged out of the city to avoid a possible pandemic. He's bugged out of his former life altogether. Well, I was working as an IT engineer earning good money, but it was just incredibly stressful, zillions of hours, and because I was getting to the point where I could feel I was going to hurt someone. I was at work one day and I just said, this is not doable. And I had a sort of like long argument with my line manager and he said, well, you do choose to be here. And you know when somebody says something to you in your head, just you hear a bong inside your head, like a, just a moment of clarity. And I already knew some people that were living in a teepee and it was just like, I should do that. Zach and his teepee are preparing for disaster on a small campsite in West Yorkshire. His job at a local factory pays for food and water, and the local woods provide much of the fuel he needs. Um, looking for wood that's been here a while, that's nice and dried out. You're looking for stuff that's got the bark taken off it, because most of the moisture in wood is going to be in the bark. my axe, it's crucial. It's probably the most important tool. It's the thing I would rush back into a burning teepee to go fetch. It's a crucial part of my central heating system. There's this and the stove. There would probably be people that would watch this and say, you know, guys completely snapped. And, you know, they could possibly be right. But I know I'm a lot happier than I have been, you know, since I was about 20. There have been several days when I just can't get a fire lit for love nor money and I just have to abandon it and go back to bed. And I would imagine if you had another person that wanted you to get the fire lit really quickly that was nagging you, you know, outside of the cat, you'd probably it would probably be even harder to light than it is normally. Is that why you choose to live alone? No, <laughs> it's just you can't, ex you can't get, you know, I don't think I could persuade anybody to live like this. It's not just the fire, it's the whole environment. In addition to the basics, Zach has one other piece of equipment with which he plans to survive a global catastrophe. Well, a computer is the everything else tool. It's the, the AK-47 of the, of the 21st century. It just does everything else. Zach believes that the contents of this PC could be crucial to the continuation of life as we know it. On the drive on here, there's 23,000 e-books. There's no way without knowledge of modern technology that we'd ever be able to rebuild civilization. Basically, we'd be blown back to, at best, the Middle Ages, which would mean we'd have to have the Renaissance again. We'd have to learn virtually all that science again. You're not necessarily going to have another Pythagoras crop up if you're all 
fighting for survival. You know, you think, well, you know, if, if all it took was like 10 pounds worth of memory stick and I could have saved 20,000 most important books, you'd know that you wouldn't lose Shakespeare, you wouldn't lose, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft or whatever it is you find important. So that, you know, you would sooner or later be able to rebuild all of humans' art and intelligence and their ingenuity. You could get that back really quickly. If you destroy all that, it'll take another 200,000 years to do it. And I'm not that patient. For Zach, computers might be a way of preserving civilization, but for many preppers, they're the gateway to a vast online community of like-minded individuals. This little candle in here is bringing the temperature up like you wouldn't believe. Look at that! That's proper fire, man! There he goes. Yeah, that was definitely dead. You know, always give your stuff a try run before you come out and then come unstuck. Darren is a 41-year-old railway worker from Hampshire, but is known to his online fans as Funky Prepper. <sighs> it's going to take a while. Back soon. So basically, this is the, the nerve centre of operations from Funky Prepper's channel on YouTube, really. This is where the magic happens. Darren has only been posting clips on the internet for one year, but he's already produced over 100 online videos. Roughly one every three days. You know, no one lives forever, and this is a good way of um, immortalising myself, really. The moment is 131,646 people have watched the videos, which is astonishing, really, if I'm honest. Just blows me away even today. Darren doesn't appear in his videos alone. He has a co star, his truck. Um, this is my 4x4 bug out vehicle. Um, basically, it's what we guys use in the trade to get out of Dodge when things go bad. Got side steps, obviously you can stand on there, you can shoot from there. Also got a um, CP area on there, it's great for bugging out because if the roads are going to jam, you, know, you need to find out where the traffic hotspots are to avoid them. One arm for a coffee, anybody? Thanks a lot mate, cheers. Darren has over £8,000 worth of kit he believes is essential for survival. Although his wife, Joyce, might disagree. The money that Darren spent on prepping could have probably bought a new kitchen or a few luxuries in the house, or he may have had even more time to do a bit of decorating. What I've got here is um, a generator, I've got Knives, tools, um, my own seeds to grow my own vegetables, you know, out in the wilds. So, camouflage net as well. Darren, his kit and his truck are off to shoot a new bug out video. Right, today I'm just um, off to one of my bug out locations, bug out location number two. He has said that all the stuff would be in the truck. It's just me, you, the dog. Uh, I think he would take the cats as well. I don't know about the old one. There's um, multiple scenarios why you would have to bug out, really. If it become quite apparent that there was localised rioting, looting, you can imagine how bad things can get. And obviously, it's pretty much illegal to own semi-automatic weapons and pistols alike. So, if you want to try and defend your property without such weapons, good luck to you, that's all I'm saying. Darren arrives safely at bug out location number two. He's shooting today's video with a fellow prepper he met <laughs> online. He goes by the handle Roach. Hello, mate. How are you, Funky? How you doing? I'm all right, good to see you again. Yeah, it's all good, mate, all good. Spectre gadget. Doing videos with Roach is brilliant because we both have our own ideas. Oh, very nice. And it's interesting to sort of um, bump ideas off each other. You got a name for it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Foxy. <laughs> what we're doing making videos and posting them on the internet is we're sharing information. You know, we're sharing good ideas. I'm gonna have to go back a bit, mate. 
Right where the brambles are, nice one. Today is the 109th video that Funky Prepper has made. You're on. Hey, what I want to talk to you today about is just uh, small game traps. So don't think for a moment that these things are toys. Working with Roach is great. You say to him, stop, and he stops. Say to him, start, and he starts. It's just a perfect actor, really, and they're called laughing for it. Ouch. If you get your hands For Darren, sharing tips on how to survive catastrophe isn't the only upside to the internet. I mean, the way I see the internet and YouTube especially, it's like a great big fuzzy pair of arms that just wraps around you. A lot of my fans and subscribers send me all sorts of gifts completely out of the blue. And um, I don't ask for it, I don't expect it, but you know, the amount of times I'll get a message saying, I really love your videos, I want to send you something. <sighs> what can I do? <laughs> Okay, YouTube, as always, any comments? Love to hear them. Back soon. It's a wrap. Well, when you're talking shit, it's the fan. It's deadly serious. I mean, people all of a sudden aren't nice anymore. Preppers yeah, like Darren like, also like to share their fears over the internet. And you notice animals will change as well. You know, dogs are going to be running around in packs, and they're not going to be cute, cuddly little domesticated animals anymore. No way, mate. They're going to rip your leg off just for a laugh for something to eat. In County Durham, one of Prepping's youngest recruits has been watching and learning. There's things happening around the world, such as Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Katrina, the Greece riots, the London riots, and things along those lines. They get that close to escalating into a global crisis, but people think it couldn't possibly happen. People think that it will always be controlled, but if it isn't controlled, then it's game over, really. Sam may be only 12, but he's been prepping since the age of nine. I get all my ideas off the internet and things like out my SGS Survival Guide book. A lot of the time I use my computer for um, communicating with other preppers and share ideas because I physically can't meet them in person. This is a video I've made about a homemade stove. It's a very pocket stove, um, you know, really small, just in the side of the really. I can't use my real name, uh, so I'm known as the Bushcraft Dude. Hi everybody, it's me. Um, today I'm going to be doing another video in the woods, thank goodness, as you can see. I get ideas from the community and I give ideas to them back. Like most preppers, Sam has had to make a choice between bugging out and bugging in. Bugging in is basically when you hunker down in one area with all your food and your water in your house. You know, people with like 20 years of rations and everything in their homes, they're going to get looted like that. Um, because if you've got a mob of a 100 angry people, no matter, even if you've got a flamethrower, you can't really do much about that. County Durham, in the north of England, has over 17,000 hectares of woodland. And schoolboy prepper Sam has a plan to escape disaster and bug out to the woods. This here, this is my main bug out bag. Um, this has got things that I feel comfortable for me to survive, for, not for anyone else, but just for me. Um, this has got things, you know, like food, your water, your tarpaulins, your hunting equipment and things like that. Sam's family aren't preppers, but he plans to take them with him and has secretly prepared bug out bags for them too. But over here, I've got um, things like my sister's bug out bag, uh, which has got, you know, things like teddy bears and stuff in for her. My sister's only eight years old, so um, her bug out bag was really difficult to design it's because obviously I can't include things like knives and lighters and um, machetes and things in her bug out bag because um, that would be obviously dangerous on her behalf. If you're by yourself <laughs> and you've left, you've left your family behind and they're dead, that's going to put a huge psychological impact on you which is why I've got them prepared as well as me. Like all preppers, Sam practices his survival skills in the field. Dad Danny helps out. Well, it's just down there, down the corner. The reason we've come here is because this is one of my pre-designated bug out locations. So um, if for whatever reason I can't go to my local woodland, this is basically in the middle of nowhere. You've got a fresh water supply, there's Plenty of food like and lots of wood and it's, everything's really yeah. plentiful here. Those ponies down there somewhere. Yeah. 
He started off, funnily enough, when he was three. He made a desert survival kit and he took it to nursery with him, three years old. Now, I didn't, I didn't tell him to do that. He was just really interested. And then he got an interest in first aid and he was interested in what he did if someone hurt themselves in certain situations. And it kind of led from one thing yeah. to the other. Sam, tell me what you're doing. Um, getting some birch bark for the um, fire. Uh, it's really good tinder because it's full of oil and resin. The oil will always um, burn, no matter what the weather, really. I think when children see things in the media, it can be quite worrying. I mean, I can remember myself, when I was about Sam's age, worrying about the alignment of the planets in about 1976. I thought the world was going to end. And in some ways, that's Sam revisiting my own experiences. If you could get some wood to yeah, use as kindling, I'll start making a platform. There was a media hype of um, the end of the world a few months ago. He got quite upset about that, and we had to explain to him that it was, it was media hype. And it's part of growing up. Children do worry when they're younger. But I feel we've got a good relationship. Me and his mum talk to him a lot about things like that. Absolutely love coming to the woods with me dad, practicing skills that could be useful. As in, if the world, if there's an economical collapse, how are you going to use a computer? Because the internet will be down. If you spend all your time on your phone, how are you going to use that? The telephone connection will be down. So I'm practicing skills that I might need. It's part of human nature, um, particularly uh, from a young boy's point of view, to light fires, be out in the woods to whittle sticks and, and to make camps and dens and, and to look at first age, what do you do in this certain situation? It's a bit of fantasy. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, the term prepper, there's nothing wrong at all with being a prepper. It's a, perhaps a healthy thing. It certainly is for a young boy, rather than being sat on a computer or watching TV for hours and hours. He's outside doing things and he's, he's quite happy doing that. And as a, as a dad, that's what I want to encourage. When you're setting up camp, you need um, your camp to be near water. And also there's lots of resources here. It's basically a supermarket, so you can get your rabbit, you can get your wood, you can get your tinder, you can get anything, really. If you get some more wood, Dad, I'll put the tarp up. Do you know what time it is? Loving care. <laughs> With the campfire built, there's time for father and son to relax. <laughs> pour it in water, like two or three crystals, it purifies it. I don't think my mum likes me being a prepper because she thinks I am absolutely bonkers. She thinks that um, I'm way over the top with my prepping, but I don't think that at all. There's people who are a lot worse than me. I think Sam sometimes takes things on board and, and might blow it out of proportion. Um, but the tapestry of life is that we all see things differently and Sam certainly sees things his way. A trip to the local beach is another opportunity for Sam to prepare for disaster. For me, it's about being out here in the outdoors with my son, but he has a different take on it. I think he sees it as developing a set of skills that he needs to prepare for things in the future. Basically, this is a challenge that me and my dad have. It's called extreme brews. What we do is we'll go to really harsh environments like this, and I'll see if I can make them a cup of tea or a cup of bovril. Cheers! <laughs> when Sam and his dad are doing prepping together, it's quite bonding for them. They love being outside in the outdoors, and that's one thing that prepping does. They like being out there, all weathers, rain. They like um listening to the birds or whatever else that they do cook their own food <laughs> get away from the missus <laughs> hot chocolate funky wouldn't say no mate i love going out in the woods i love playing around in the woods i'm still a child i build dens out in the woods but because i'm grown up i can't call it a den now i have to call it a bug out location Oh. <laughs> it's a... 
no matter how well protected our nuclear power stations are, things do go wrong. And unless we prepare all those nuclear power stations in Warhead, they could leave us in a big amount of trouble. In Britain, very few people have ever come face to face with a nuclear disaster, but there are people preparing for one. History does show us that these things do happen. The Japanese earthquake and the tsunami that followed it, and then the nuclear, you know, the nuclear disaster that, that followed that. You know, three linked events, and it, these people have all had their lives turned upside down. On the 11th of March, 2011, an earthquake struck Japan. The tsunami that followed killed 16,000 people. And three reactors at the Fukushima power station went into nuclear meltdown. Security guard and former paratrooper Richard watched in horror, convinced his hometown in Essex could suffer the same fate. Power's going to be gone, sanitation's going to be gone, you're going to have to improvise all of these things for yourself. There's going to be a lot of panic. Rule of law, it can and will break down. People are going to start trying to take you know, what they need to survive I mean, from wherever they can find it. And if people get in their way, there's going to be uh, some nasty consequences. Despite the dangers, Richard plans to stay put in the city and bug in. So the advantages that you can have being in an urban environment are there are plenty of resources. It may not necessarily be in the way of all the food and stuff like that, but there are resources and material to work with. You've already got shelter and a certain amount of security provided by, you know, four walls, as it were. Richard's planning for urban survival begins at home where he collects lots and lots of kit. Being a prepper and also being a single bloke, I haven't got a you know, wife and children to, uh, to worry about. Um, so my life can be a little bit more dedicated to myself. I would describe this as one of my oldest friends. Um, and the reason I describe it as one of my oldest friends, it was bought for my 21st birthday. In my pockets, sanitation. If you're constipated or uncomfortable, I've got the ability to yeah, wipe and, again, clean my hands afterwards. Richard already had a lot of useful equipment and skills from his time in the parachute regiment. My military skills are not 100% essential to being a prepper, but they, again, there's an advantage that I've got, sorting my equipment out, yeah, making sure it's ready to go. This is a piece of camp security. What I basically do with this, I can fix it to a tree, run the wire out, put the lever down, take that, put it inside it, someone trips it, you get a loud noise, but also you've got the light going off as well. Whistle, yeah, this is gonna be heard a lot better than your voice. If that's Thunderbird 1, this is Thunderbird 2. Yeah, this is the heavy equipment. Sort of a a meteor strike in my house or something like that, which would be nothing I could do about, um, I would be prepared for, to deal with any kind of disaster. I've got a cup of tea in there, I've got coffee in there, I've got hot chocolate in there. Yeah, this is a massive morale boost to having a hot drink. Even if the world's collapsed, I've got the ability to make myself a cup of tea. Magnifying glass, another method of lighting a fire. Also, the other thing that you use magnifying glass is to see a splinter, yeah? Get a splinter. If you get a splinter, you can get an infection. If you get an infection, you're in trouble. People like myself would become leaders because we've set out to plan and get ready in advance. Yeah? We've gained the skills, we've gained the knowledge and hopefully people would see that very quickly and people do like to have some order in their life and I like to have somebody who's presenting them with that order. Parachute regiment motto, Eutrichus Paratus, ready for anything. Yeah. There are few things preppers love more than their survival equipment, known as their preps. Yeah, mate, look at this. Uh, today I'm going to be covering five essential items I'd like to have. Um, well, the five essential items to survive. 
Hey, I've been using this since about May time this year. Special Forces shovel. This one came from Cold Steel. It's got this lovely Cordura case. But there's one prepper in Scotland who's bucking the trend and prepping without preps. You don't need any fancy kit because all the fancy kit's out there. 6 a.m. and minus three degrees Celsius and 45-year-old factory worker Stuart is waking up after spending the night in a shelter he built himself. If normal people had to do this, <laughs> there'd probably be a lot less people on the planet. Because, <laughs> you know, survival is uh, survival of the fittest. Many preppers believe that we are closer than ever to a complete collapse of civilization. In September 2008, to some, the global financial system seemed poised for collapse. Lehman Brothers folded. Many other banks reached the brink, and it took trillions of dollars of bailouts from Western governments to save them. Stewart believes the next financial shock could be even worse. Every major civilization has collapsed. Um, the people who maybe had knowledge and skills for, for hunting and trapping things would survive. If there was some sort of disaster, um, people could head out to places like this. Um, I know I would, because uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with um, my skill sets, and um, in fact, I find it a pleasure to be, to be up here, <laughs> to be honest. Every week, Stuart leaves his wife and two daughters at home to practice his survival skills. It's fine reading books and looking at diagrams, and it's not until you actually practice it yourself, then you understand. But then you, you hone that skill um, until it becomes second nature. Today, he's making an animal trap. Basically what I'm making here is a deadfall trap. Basically, uh, use a heavy object to fall on the animal uh, to dispatch it. You can upscale, downscale with this um, to suit any size game from mice to deer. What we have here is the part of the trigger mechanism for the trap. What we need is the Y stick. Your tr trigger mechanism will be in under here, attached to two pieces of cord, so it's giving you two trip wires. When the animal walks in, it pulls the trigger out, your deadfall comes down and there's the coup de gras. All across Britain, preppers are practicing making animal traps. In Scotland, Stuart is after deer, so his trap needs to be big. And because Stuart is preparing to survive a global financial collapse, his trap also needs to cost nothing. It's easy to fall into the, the kit trap and throw money at it. To me, you've got to go back to the, to the basics and then everything else comes easy. It's for my own self-knowledge that I have made the trap, I've practiced it, I know that the mechanics of it work, that I've now stored it in here, how to build it, how to use it. So there we have, get my breath back, the deadfall um, trap for larger game. As you can see with the trap wires, they're, they're fairly loose. If it was too tight, it would fall hit on the back of the head. Whereas to actually, to dispatch the animal, you want it, the animal's shoulders to be under. So the head is past its shoulders, and then the deadfall drops, thus crushing the rib cage on impact. Hopefully get you your tea, your meal. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to trip there. <laughs> Stuart won't be catching any deer with this trap because it's illegal. But his plan to survive without expensive kit doesn't stop with traps. Back home he has a shed full of handcrafted weapons and tools for hunting and fishing, um, we have bows. So I have to have the, the knowledge how to make uh, a bow, and then obviously you need arrows, which uh, are the hardest part to make. Um, and what we have 
uh, is a bone tip and then what we do is bind it with sinew and then we have the glue on top which is um, pine resin mixed with charcoal dust. Uh, with this you could hunt uh, anything from the size of rabbit up to um, deer. So by making the, the, the arrow you're self-sufficient. You can fill your, your, your stomach basically. Uh, you can go for instance to, to um, something like a, a, a fish trap using hazel. Seeing the bait inside, can't get in, has to go up through the cone to get into it. And once it's inside, they can't get back out again. Yeah, a lot of preppers uh, are, are using modern kit. It's easy to, to throw money at it, but once you're in a, a scenario where money isn't applicable anymore, then that's where these skills uh, become important. In Yorkshire, TP dweller Zach has made a change to his off-the-grid living arrangements. So after three years of living in a teepee, there, you realise that there are certain things you can't do in a teepee, apart from the fact you've got a serious damp issue, and I wanted to explore alternative energy. You can't pin a solar panel to a teepee. Uh, this isn't really a caravan. I know, to me, as far as I'm concerned, it's more like a living system that I'm experimenting with. So I lose all the, the cool factor of living in a teepee. Um, and I am having to sleep with the door open because I can't really sleep inside yet. Zach may be having trouble adjusting to this new home, but one person is happy. My mum is really pleased that I'm in a caravan and I'm not exposed to the elements and stuff like that. It's really embarrassing being 42 and your mum's still worrying about you. You know, it's sort of like, I do worry about you, and if it's cold, I get an extra phone call. Preppers are often seen as eccentric, but in a world where our news is dominated by war, disease and disaster, there will always be people in the UK who will continue to prepare. A long time ago, people thought the earth was flat, and, you know, a few people said it was round. They all laughed at them and said they're crazy, but just because it hasn't happened, doesn't mean to say it won't. To me, prepping is about giving my family and me the essentials to survive after any sort of disaster. If there's no disaster, fantastic. If someone had a crystal ball and told me, don't worry, there's never going to be a solar flare, there's never going to be an asteroid arrive, I say, well, that's pretty good. But disasters do happen, and this Earth spinning around for how many millions of years things have tripped species up beforehand, we may be the next one on the link.